and hello. In this presentation, we will look at the influence that social processes and the values driving them have on environmental flows. We are going to discuss why the assessment of environmental flows needs to be based on a strong involvement of multiple stakeholders or water users. Water is a human right and is now being considered also as a right of the environment. Therefore, it is important to understand how the concept of water ethics is changing the way people perceive water and the need to maintain water flows for the well-being of people and our planet. Water is used in many ways by people. An individual or a group of people can use water at different times and for different purposes. For example, water from a river can be used for drinking, for irrigation, or for recreation. This use of water is influenced by the values that different groups of people give to it. And these different values might lead different approaches to manage water resources. Here we describe some of them. However, we need to specify that different cultures might lean to one of these approaches, even when that is not the preference of other sectors of the population. And that is because different groups of population have different values. We have, for example, countries in which indigenous groups consider water not as a resource, but an entity that has value by itself, like an intrinsic value. So what is an utilitarian approach? It is the one that considers water as one of the components of the environment, but just as another resource, as a commodity, that can be traded or appropriated. A consequentialist approach considers that human actions have consequences for other people and even to non-human beings. This sets the responsibility that different organizations and even different individuals have for managing resources in the right way and to respond for the consequences that the decisions on how they have managed those resources will have on other people. In this case, we can see, for example, the case of authorities that if they don't manage resources correctly, some sectors of the population might be set in disadvantage. An intrinsic approach considers that the environment and all its components have a value by itself. Sometimes it is called the existence value. This means that the resource, in this case water, is not just something that can be exploited. And this existing value is something that has been used to promote conservation. For example, the intrinsic value of biodiversity. In some countries, there is still a theistic approach. So this considers that uh, there is a god and that rivers are the creation of that god. And also makes humans accountable for how they are treating this resource that belongs to a divine entity. And this is the case of many indigenous cultures. So how people value water, which one of these approaches they take to relate to the resource will determine whether it is just seen as a commodity and something that people can use as they want because they have paid for it, or is something that does not belong to people, although people have the right to use them, but is something that belongs to everybody, 
for example, a common wood. In different countries, now there is uh, legislation that recognizes that the environment or specific rivers are entities. And then there are groups of people that consider as the stewards responsible for protecting that entity or that resource. So uh, defining a part of the environment, in this case, a river as an entity or a li living being with rights brings another dimension of how water in this case should be managed by humans. This perception that other living and non-living entities might have rights has influenced how people are thinking about water and has resulted in the creation of the term and now like a field that is water ethics. This has resulted because the current approaches to manage water have not resulted in people having an equitable access to water resources. And in many cases, the use of water and other natural resources is driven by the interest of the specific sectors that have power or specific groups of people to satisfy their interests and not uh, by the interest to satisfy the need of all the living and non-living beings. So the degradation of natural resources, also the problems that have resulted because of pollution of water have brought the need to discuss what are the ethical implications of the decisions that are made and that influence how the resources are used. So water ethics questions the motives behind the decisions that are made at political level on how water is going to be allocated to different uses and also the decisions and repercussions of those actions that are implemented. Uh, for example, if uh, a country wants to put a dam on a river that is considered sacred, what are the implications of that? How that decision and the action of building the dam will affect the people that see this river as a deity or even a relative in, for example, the case of the Maori people that see the river as their father. Water ethics also calls for accountability for the outcomes of those decisions and actions. So if the outcome could be to, for instance, satisfy a need of the population, that could be desirable for everybody. But if the outcome is, for example, to satisfy some private interest, then it's not as desirable. And it is questioned how ethical the decision of behind this project, for example, the dam, could be. So water ethics also relates to water governance because there should be accountability for the consequences of the actions and the outcomes. Water ethics also calls for integrating in management decisions the perspectives that different cultures and different values have in how they see and relate to the resources. Water ethics also refers to the rights of the environment. Before, ethics had been limited mainly to humans, but now water ethics brings the recognition that also other 
living entities and even the environment have the right to enjoy and to live. Therefore, if water is a resource that they need, they also need to be considered in water allocation. One point that water ethics also discusses is the limitation of natural resources. We have a finite, finite supply of water and the earth can only change to a certain degree without having the natural processes collapse. Then water ethics calls for defining uh, how much change is needed to preserve the integrity of the ecosystems that also will be crucial to maintain the well-being of people. Water ethics promotes the adoption of some principles to guide responsible and knowledge-based management of water resources for future generations of all life forms on Earth. There are six, six principles. Respect for human dignity brings the perspective of human rights, but also the respect for the life of other living beings and of nature. So this brings to the picture the rights of nature that are recognized, for example, in countries like Ecuador or Bolivia. Equity and proportionality implied prioritizing vulnerable groups when the resources are scarce. Uh, this calls, for example, also to give water to species that are getting uh, rare or endangered and need water for their survival. Solidarity promotes care and support among different individuals, groups, and between humans and non-living beings. It recognizes the interdependence that individuals have on other individuals, that social groups have on other social groups, and that humans have on the natural environment, including biodiversity. So it includes so solidarity with biotic communities. The principle of the common good recognizes that resources are for the well-being of everybody, every living being, and opposes the tendency to maximize the individual interest over the interests of other human beings or other species. Right relationship or responsible stewardship involves collective action to manage water resources efficiently. And considering that the action should aim to achieve the well-being of present and future generations. Also, as mentioned before, as other generations of living organisms, the ecosystems, and the uh, continuing of natural processes. Inclusive and deliberative participation extends the principle of right relationship to the process of policy making and to participation of people in water governance and management. So this principle calls for the existence or the implementation of democratic institutions that will support participatory management with involvement of all the stakeholders, empowering communities or vulnerable groups, promoting transparency, and supporting access to information so everybody could be able to participate in the decisions. Including environmental flows in water, environmental policies, and other laws that might influence the implementation of environmental flows will support the assessment 
of EFLOS and the redesign of water allocation practices for different uses. Very often, the changes in law and policy will need to be followed by adjustments in management and governance structures in the water sector. This will enable the participation of different sectors of society equally in the process to define and later implement the environmental flows. Because conflicts among divergent interests can prevent the adoption of environmental flows, it is important to have an institutional structure that will set the foundations for participatory and transparent processes. This will be crucial to build trust among all the different stakeholders. This will help uh, move the process and also will help people feel more comfortable to express their different values, concerns, or needs, promoting more collaboration. For collaboration, it is important that everybody understands the needs and interests of the other people, even if they don't totally agree with them. The important point is to find common interests that will help the process move along. Feeling that the process is transparent and that everybody has been able to contribute to it is very important because defining environmental flows will result in changes on how water is being allocated. These changes will result in trade-offs. So these trade-offs means that to gain something, people will need to give up something else. We can also say that could be things that will be gained, for example, a better environment, uh, more water, but there are other things that might be lost. For example, the ability of some individuals to control water resources or any other things. So the understanding of how the implementation of eFlows is going to influence how water is being managed but also the benefits that this will have is important for everybody to accept the changes that are needed. So it is important that the political structure allows the participation of the stakeholders. Otherwise, we come back to the situation with conflicts among different groups might obstruct the process. So the principles of water governance and water ethics are important to guide these processes, especially in countries where um, the management of resources has been not traditionally democratic. It is important to consider the different values and interests of stakeholders and to communicate how the decisions are being made. Also, it is important to integrate the knowledge that different disciplines will bring and not disregard the traditional or local knowledge that some communities might have. This will also validate their interest and for everybody, it will be important to feel that they are able to participate in the process so they can feel ownership for the final results. The social and political processes that will lead to the implementation of the flows in a river basin should include all the stakeholders because they are a key component to achieve integrated water resource management. Stakeholders are defined as anyone having an interest in a particular situation. And they can be groups of people like communities or organizations 
authorities or individuals. Stakeholders have a direct or indirect interest in a project, a problem, or an intervention. They can be affected positively or negatively by a decision or a proposal that will be decided, but also they could have uh, or could be affecting a specific resource. But involving all the stakeholders is important for the implementation of any policy, plan, project, or other interventions. Other terms that are used to refer to stakeholders are actors or interest groups, but here we are not going to distinguish among them. Uh, coming back to the point of the different values that people have for the environment or parts of them, um, it's important to uh, recognize that indigenous groups consider those aspects that they refer to as entities also as stakeholders. So more increasingly in some situations, specific rivers or even features of the environment are considered stakeholders and authorities and others guiding the process need to be open to accept the people that represent these stakeholders that speak on their behalf. So it could be nature or rivers. For example, in New Zealand, the Maori people are the legal guardians of the Wanganui River. And this means that the decision makers need to consider what they say because they speak for the well-being of this river that I mentioned they consider as their father. So respect for how other groups relate to resources is very important. There are several guides available now for assessing environmental flows and supporting their implementation. Here we can see some of them. The involvement of stakeholders is covered to different degrees because each guide has a different focus. For example, on the left we have the guide that is promoted by the Food and Agricultural Organization and this emphasizes water stress. The green is created by the World Meteor Meteorological Organization, and this focuses mainly on the use of data. The guide in blue by the International Finance Corporation focuses on hydropower and the maintenance of e flows in regulated rivers. The guide from the IUCN flow guides in general the, about the process and some considerations. And the guide by the European Union is focused mainly on how to implement the e flows within the Water Framework Directive. We have talked before about the stakeholders and environmental flows. And one of the points that we mentioned is that they can support or oppose the implementation of environmental flows. Before we have covered the principles of water governance and they are very relevant for the involvement of stakeholders. That is because people have the right to participate in decisions uh, that might affect them positively or negatively. And Participation will support transparency and also will help build trust and collaboration among different stakeholders. This is important to reach consensus on the objectives that are needed and the actions required to achieve those objectives. Consensus will reduce the likelihood of conflicts. 
but also a transparent process that is participatory will create a sense of ownership among all those involved and will contribute to the sustainability of the initiative. Also, it's important to be sure that every people has access to the information and knowledge and because everybody needs to be informed on the same grounds to make the decisions. So all the stakeholders are important in the process of defining and implementing eFlows. They can contribute with different skills, knowledge, experience, and techniques, also with different resources. Scientific and local knowledge should, should be considered together and validated if it is needed. But also another part in which stakeholders are very important although not often are included, is in the monitoring and evaluation of the implementation of eFlows. Now, summarizing, it's very important that the stakeholders are involved through all the process. Before the process starts, stakeholders can promote the adoption of eFlows in laws and policies. They can help later assess the dependencies of different user groups on the flows and can collaborate in surveys or gathering of information. The stakeholders can help identify also the pressures that are affecting biophysical and hydrological conditions that influence environmental flows. They are very important in the definition of the environmental and socioeconomic objectives that should be achieved by implementing flows. And this involves setting the vision and also the targets that could be achieved and defining what is the gap between the current status for instance, uh, the existing condition of flows and what is desired. We mentioned that it, they also need to be involved in the decision and the implementation and are a very useful resource in the monitoring and evaluation of the process to follow a management uh, approach that is adapted to the changing conditions not only on the physical environment, but also on the socioeconomic environment. So for stakeholder involvement, there are specific goals. The first one is that stakeholders understand and accept the need for environmental flows. Once that is achieved, it's important also to involve them in the, in the identification of obstacles for the implementation of environmental flows. We mentioned before that they can help collect information, but also because there are trade-offs involved, they are very useful to consider different alternatives to reach the objectives. So they can propose mechanisms and measures on how to implement the flows. In some cases, this will require planning a phase approach to implementation to minimize the negative consequences that an approved transition could have. So let's conclude this presentation by highlighting some key messages. The whole people have related to water and the natural environment is influenced by individual and collective values. And these are reflected in the way that institutions manage resources. So water ethics consider the ethical implications that management decisions have for different groups 
not only of people, but also for the natural environment, which is considered now as a legitimate water use. The involvement of stakeholders is essential for the success of initiatives that aim to implement inflows, especially in river basins where rivers have been altered and water is allocated already. Because uh, it needs to be clear how much change can be made in allocation and it still need uh, satisfy the needs of all the different users. Stakeholders can contribute with knowledge and expertise in the process. They are important for setting the vision that everybody should agree on and the objectives that will be pursued. Later, they can help implementing measures and evaluate the success of the implementation of environmental flows. <music>